Good morning um, or afternoon. This is Moshmi, your teacher, Galaxies and ISM. I'm now recording the ISM part of the, of the class and I'm sharing, I'm going to share the movie of this recording with you as well as the PDF slides. So I'm now going to share my screen with my slides and we will start. Um, we will go to the previous slide. Yes. And we will stop video. Okay. So this is, um, this is the first slide and you can see a very nice picture of the GMRT telescope on it. And uh, this lecture will be a fairly short lecture because it's going to be an introduction to the course on ISM. Now the books that I will follow are the Physics of the Interstellar, Interstellar and Intergalactic Medium by Bruce Drain. And the second book that I will follow is by Dyson and Williams. Now, while doing this course, as usual, just like the Galaxies course, I will also give homework sheets. If there's time to, otherwise I'll give one homework sheet. And I want you all to complete it and give it to me as soon as the classes resume, because you will be graded on that as well. And also, because it will help you prepare, just like the Galaxies course for the exam on ISM. I know that most of you have already uh, submitted your seminar topics. Those of you who have not, please send me a mail with the topic that you have chosen. Now the interstellar medium is not a huge mass component of galaxies, but it is one of the most important uh, parts of galaxies because we can see it and also because it is the medium where stars are formed. Now star formation, as you know, is like one of the main components of galaxy evolution. It is one of the main ways in which galaxies are become metal enriched. One of the main ways in which um, energy is recycled through the interstellar medium. So there are many, many facets of the importance of the interstellar medium. But uh, first, let me just go back a step and tell you about how the interstellar medium was formed. Now, at early epochs, there was nothing but, you could say, an interstellar medium. Because as galaxies formed due to the collapse of massive gas clouds in the very early universe, then this gas forms stars. So the baryonic mass in galaxies was really all ISM at the beginning. And then this, after the stars formed and the galaxies merged, we started having more and more elliptical galaxies and of course more and more uh, disk galaxies. Now, as the star formation proceeded, the interstellar medium got used up and it depended upon the rate at which stars formed in the early universe. So as you can see, elliptical galaxies have, have very little interstellar gases and hence they have finished most of their star formation whereas these galaxies still have a significant amount of interstellar gas dust and they are still forming stars so interstellar medium has significant is the significant reservoir of gas in galaxies and it is really mainly important for spiral or disk galaxies because the elliptical galaxies have more or less finished their ISM quota. Now the ISM is depleted by star formation and this star formation eats up the mass, it reprocesses it and gives out metals. In the process, it has these supernova explosions, it gives out the mass also as stellar winds and stellar outflows. So in this way, the matter in the interstellar medium is processed and finally it ends up as white dwarfs, neutron stars and black holes. So there is a sink happening. The interstellar medium is used, used up and ends up in the dead stars. But a lot of it goes back. It's 
through the supernova explosions and stellar winds outflows. Now, the way the interstellar medium is increased or replenished is through gas infall. Gas infall comes from interactions with other galaxies and it also comes from gas infall from the cosmic web or the intergalactic medium, the IGM. Now I will just quickly go through the components of the ISM. The interstellar medium ISM is really made up of everything that lies between the stars. So this means that you have not just the baryonic component, which is the interstellar gases, but you also have dust, cosmic rays, electromagnetic radiation, magnetic field, and the gravitational field, as well as the dark matter. Now the component that we will focus on in these lectures is the interstellar gas. That is the main baryonic component of the interstellar medium. And the velocity distribution of the interstellar medium, the gases, is mainly thermal. So, and it includes the neutral hydrogen or H1 gas as we call it, the molecular hydrogen gas, the ionized hydrogen, and of course, trace elements such as helium, lithium, magnesium, and others. Now, the interstellar dust is dust as we know it. It is very microscopic particles of dust. But these dust particles, even though they have very small mass component, you will find out in this course that they play a very crucial role in the ISM. And that's because molecules of hydrogen are formed on the surface of the interstellar dust particles, which have a solid state lattice kind of a structure. So we will talk about that later. Now the other parts of the uh, ISM, oh, okay, sorry, I forgot the cosmic rays. The cosmic rays is composed of ions and electrons, which have very high kinetic energies and so their energies are not thermal, unlike the gases. The cosmic rays, the origin for cosmic rays is mainly the uh, supernova explosions in galaxies, but it is also the AGN, active galactic nuclei of nearby galaxies. All AGN give out large amounts of um, plasma as jets and outflows. So these contribute to the uh, fraction of ion, ionized particles and electrons, and a lot of them are captured by the galaxies and become what we call cosmic ray particles. Now, the fourth component here, the electromagnetic radiation, is made up of many components, but the main component, the first component is the cosmic microwave background radiation. So this CMB, as you call it, is something that originated at early epochs, and I'm sure you have studied it in cosmology. But apart from the CMB, we have a huge amount of radiation emission coming from the stars as starlight, as well as emission from ions and molecules and the grains. Now the grains, as I mentioned, are small particles, and you can approximately take them to be like small black bodies, okay? So they give out a kind of a black body radiation. They also give out synchrotron radiation. And there is, of course, a lot of radiation coming from relativistic electrons, which have been accelerated by high energy processes near the, mainly near the compact stars, like neutron stars, black holes. Magnetic field, gravitational field, these are, fields which you are all familiar with and they play a very crucial role in the uh, energetics of galaxies and of course the dark matter is something I've often mentioned in the course. The intergalactic medium is basically the hot warm ionized medium which lies mostly between galaxies, IGM. And a lot, large part of the IGM which you may have learned about in cosmology is in the cosmic web, web-like structure, which connects all the galaxies and in, in uh, clusters. It's like um, 
it's like a plasma it's like a plasma web which connects all the uh, uh, components of the uh, clusters and of course the large scale structure okay now this slide is a very is has got a lot of things written it in it it is about the gas mass components of the ism it's a very important slide because it's telling you two things. In the bottom of the slide, it tells you about the thickness of the gas layer in the interstellar medium. Now, this slide is, is related to only um, uh, disk galaxies. So we're talking about disk galaxies here. And the gas layer in disk galaxies above and below the mid plane lies at a height of around 500 parsecs above the z equals to zero mid plane. Okay, so that means the total thickness of the gas layer in our galaxy is around one kiloparsec. This thickness is also typical of nearby galaxies, nearby disk galaxies, which have uh, similar masses of neutral height. Now the thin disk is called the very inner part of the gas layer. It's got a height of about 250 parsecs and is very important because it is the layer which really supports star formation and the recycling of material in a galactic disk. The second component, which is much thicker, 500 parsecs, is the layer made up of the neutral hydrogen, the less dense gas, as well as the ionized hydrogen gas. So this is the thicker layer. Now I will go back to the beginning of the slide where I have written down the mass components of the ISM. As you can see, there are three mass components. There, there may be more, but these are the main three gas components of galaxies. The first one I've written here is the ionized hydrogen. This is not including helium. Now, I think uh, later in a slide I have mentioned that hydrogen and helium are considered to be the main composition of galaxies in the interstellar medium. But if you have N greater than three, anything higher than helium, it is called a metal. Now, when we want to calculate the mass of gas clouds, we have to include the helium, which will be about 20%. So it becomes um, uh, 1.4 times the mass, four, after, uh, four particles. And so 1.4 times the mass of neutral hydrogen will give you the total mass of the cloud. So that's why here I have written not including helium. Now in this list, number one is the ionized hydrogen. The second one is the neutral hydrogen. And the third one is the molecular hydrogen. And as you can see, the largest mass component of galaxies, interstellar medium, is neutral hydrogen gas. And that's why neutral hydrogen, H1 observations of galaxies, is so important because you will be tracing the main mass component of the ISM. The H1 is also important, as I mentioned earlier, in galaxy classes because it is the most extended component of galaxies. It extends all the way out to 20, 30 kiloparsecs radius. Hence, it can be used to trace the dark matter in galaxies using the galaxy rotation curves. Now, these masses are the gas fractions of our galaxy, but they are typical of most large spiral galaxies. So typically we can say that the neutral hydrogen mass is a few percent of the stellar mass. This is true in most typical most galaxies, but if you have a gas rich dark matter dominated galaxy, in general you'll find that the neutral hydrogen is similar in mass to the stars. 
So this is telling us something. It's telling us that if the neutral hydrogen is still there, then the star formation has not really kicked in. The star formation has not been able to produce enough stars so that it becomes similar to the normal large spiral galaxies. So MH1 is similar to M star in gas rich dwarfs, low luminosity galaxies, such as low surface brightness galaxies, and in the really, really optical dim, um, small gas rich galaxies. Now I'll move on to the next slide. Now, in this slide, I will talk about the different phases of the ISM. The previous slide, we talked about the different uh, mass components. In this slide, the different phases are not determined by the masses. They are determined or defined according to the temperatures of the different components. And temperature is very important because temperature also gives an estimate of the volume occupied by that component of the ISM. If the component is very hot, like the hot ionized medium, it will occupy a large volume of the ISM. But if it is really cold, like the molecular hydrogen gas, it will occupy a smaller volume. It will be the cold, dense part which is very important because the cold dense part is where star formation takes place. So the first phase, which I have written here on this slide, is called the coronal gas or the hot ionized medium. And this gas is produced by the supernova blast waves that push gas out, ionizing it through shocks. And as it does so, it heats up and ionizes the gas to temperatures of 10 to the power 5 to 10 to the power 6 Kelvin. It gives out a lot of emission lines as well. The O5, the O5 emission line is considered, um, actually it's O6 because in astronomy we consider O1 to be neutral. So I'm going to call this the O6 emission line. So the O6 emission line is very good at tracing hot ionized medium produced by supernova. Now, this gas may be hot and extended. It extends like a corona up to several, um, several hundred parsec, maybe 500, 600 parsecs above the galactic plate. But it also cools on mega year timescales. It is often found like bubbles, bubbles of 20 parsec size. And in nearby galaxies, uh, when you do research, you will find that a lot of galaxies have these bubbles or holes in neutral hydrogen. And these bubbles or holes are thought to be driven by supernova explosions. And many of them are found to be having hot ionized gas. The second component the H2 gas is the ionized hydrogen gas, which is produced by UV emission from OB stars. Now, we talked a lot about star formation in the galaxies part of the course. And if you remember, star formation happens in dense molecular clouds. And it happens in a cluster. And that cluster will have an IMF, initial mass function, and it will form a few very massive stars, the OB stars, and then you'll have several less massive stars. So the OB stars give out a lot of radiation and ionize the medium around them, producing what is called H2 regions, which are also similar to the coronal gas bubbles, but much smaller. They are just a few parsecs in size. And these regions also last for about three to 10 mega year. Apart from the H2 gas produced by OB stars, H2 gas is also, is also part of what is called diffuse H2 medium, diffuse ionized gas medium. It forms what is called the warm ionized medium, WIM. And this WIM, W-I-M, is 
it's, per, it's permeating the whole uh, intercloud regions of the ISM. So you will have bubbles of star formation, which will have maybe H2 gas inside, and then you'll have the cloud around it. And then in between the clouds, a lot of the H2 gas may have escaped, and so it will occupy that space. So the origin of diffuse H2 gas is stellar winds and outputs. Planetary nebula also give out ionized gas, but that ionized gas cools with it 10 to the power four years. So we may not see much of it unless the planetary nebula has just formed. The third phase of the ISM, and as you can notice, we are going from the hottest and the most extended, the coronal gas, the hot ionized medium, we are going now to cooler and cooler gas. And so now we are coming to the neutral gas, the warm H1 gas. This is also called WNM, warm neutral medium. It has a temperature of 10 to the power 3 to 10 to the power 4 and a density of 0.6. NH1 here uh, is actually the number particle density. So if you have to calculate the actual density of the WNM, we'll have to multiply NH1 with the mass of a hydrogen atom. Now, this uh, WNM fills about 40% of the disk volume. So you can see the coronal gas, the diffuse H1 gas, and now this WNM, they fill a large volume of the interstellar medium. The colder gas is now on this page, on this slide. So we start first with the really cold, uh, cool H1 gas, which is only around 100 degrees Kelvin. It has a density of about 30 particles per cc. And it's also called the CNM, cold neutral medium. It only fills up, you see, 1% of the disk volume. So where in the previous slide, I've said that there is a large, the ma main mass of the gas in ISM is the H1. That H1 is mainly the um, H1 gas here, which is occupying a very small volume, and the warm neutral medium, which occupies a much larger volume, but may not have so much mass. Now this last component, last two components, are the molecular hydrogen gas. The molecular hydrogen gas or H2, cold molecular hydrogen gas, are the dense clouds of uh, hydrogen found in the interstellar medium. And as you know, these dense clumps are the regions where star formation takes place. And so they are very important. They're really important for star formation. Now, one property of H2 is that it can be very easily dissociated by UV radiation. So if, if you have molecular gas near a star, it will very quickly be dissociated into neutral hydrogen. Hence, we have to, uh, hence, if molecular gas has to remain molecular, it has to be embedded within a larger neutral cloud, which in turn will be embedded probably in the ionized medium of the ISM. So there are two components of the molecular gas, the diffuse molecular gas and the dense molecular gas. And the dense molecular gas, which has a number density of about a thousand particles per cc, this is where the star formation is thought to take place. Now, you just take a minute to look at that number. It appears high compared to all the other numbers we've mentioned. But this density is actually like an ultra vacuum density on Earth. So you see, the interstellar medium is a very, very rare medium. Now, stellar outflows we've mentioned here because stellar outflows, especially in star forming galaxies, can produce a large amount of um, hot gas as well as mass, because stars eject material in the later stages of their evolution. And they also eject material when they are dying, when, when they are like coming close to white dwarfs and planetary nebula. Now we will move to the 
Next slide. In this slide, what I've done is I've made a kind of a cartoon. I apologize that it is not very good. And I did try to make it colorful, but on Star Office, that was not possible. What this is showing is the different phases. So if you look, there are these clumps, dense clumps of molecular gas. These are the regions where star formation occurs. And these dense clumps of molecular gas are embedded in a more diffuse molecular gas medium. Now, this whole region of diffuse and dense clumps of molecular gas is in turn embedded or surrounded by a diffuse H1 gas. And outside the diffuse H1 gas, you will have the diffuse H2 gas, ionized hydrogen, which forms the intercloud media in galaxies. Now, this is very important. Uh, because if the molecular gas is not shielded from UV radiation by the H1, then it cannot become dense enough to form stars. So these regions surrounding the molecular clouds are often called photodissociated regions, PDRs. So as I've written here, the HIM, the H2 regions, the WN occupy most of the disk volume. Okay, the hot and cool phases, diffuse and dense phases, all these phases actually re remain in equilibrium in the ISM. And this is because of the pressure. The pressure between the different regions is adjusted by their temperature and densities so that the ISM remains in equilibrium. Now I will go to the next slide. The composition, the element composition of the ISM. Now, you all know that star formation reprocesses material within stars, producing elements which are higher and higher atomic numbers. So initially, the composition of the ISM may have been hydrogen helium, but elements such as carbon, oxygen, magnesium, iron, these elements were formed during star formation. So in early epochs, we had less metal-rich uh, galaxies and stars, but later on, at later epochs, lower redshifts, there were more and more elements. But these elements only make up about 1% of the stellar mass. That's a very important thing to know. Even though when we look at a spectrum which has come from the interstellar medium. The emission lines, absorption lines that we see are from these trace elements. They do not make up much of the stellar mass in a galaxy. Stellar mass, the ISM mass, is still mainly made up of hydrogen and helium. Now, this is something, the third point here is something I mentioned earlier. All, all, um, all, all um, atoms which have n greater than 3 are called metals. And the fraction of metals in a galaxy determines its metals, metallicity. So if a galaxy is metal rich, it has more and more of these um, uh, trace elements. Hence, it must have had more and more star formation. So metal poor galaxies are associated with less star formation. And hence, probably they have not used up their neutral hydrogen gas. Whereas metal rich galaxies are galaxies where the stars make most of the baryonic mass. So M star is greater than MH1. So you see there is a difference between the two types, metal rich and metal poor galaxies, based on their metal content, which is related in turn to their gas content, neutral hydrogen gas content. Now metals are very important in the ISM because they help to cool the gas. So it's all like a cycle, it's all connected. If a gas, if a gas cloud has more metals, it can cool faster because these metals have electrons which can be raised to higher levels. When they come down, they give out photons. So these photons, the emission of these photons will cool the gas. So if a gas is metal rich, 
it will be able to cool faster. If it is shocked, it will cool faster. Both types of gas will therefore become cold and dense and be able to form stars. So higher metal content means cooler gas and more star formation. Now the second part, in the lower part of the slide, I have talked about the energy composition of the interstellar medium. The energy composition is, the energy is composed of thermal, kinetic, magnetic, and uh, photon energies. Now, the, all of these are linked, except the CMB, all of these are kind of linked, because if the magnetic field is not able to contain the cosmic ray particles, the cosmic ray particles help in supporting the molecular gas pressure. Now, if the bulk kinetic energy is not high enough to compress gas, star formation does not occur. So all of these things are all connected. So the star formation energies all have similar values. And these are all because they are all connected to star formation. And I would you like you to see the figure 1.3 in drain for the energy flow diagram. I think it illustrates it very nicely. And so I have not put it here, but I hope you look at it in the book. So now the energy flow correlation and the energy densities of the ISM, these are very, very important topics and I'm not going to discuss it in detail here, but I want you to remember that they are all connected except the CMB, which is decoupled, all the energies of the ISM are coupled. Now the ISM is not in thermodynamic equilibrium. The energy input in the ISM is mainly from the UV photons from stars, starlight, and it is from the high velocity ejector from supernova explosions, and also to some degree from the stellar outflows and stellar ejector. Now, this energy is lost from the galaxy. However, the galaxy, as you remember from the first figure I had referred, the galaxy, a galaxy will get accrete material from the IGM surrounding it, or it may accrete material from mergers with other galaxies, small or big. So the ISM is not in thermodynamic equilibrium. It is continuously changing as the galaxy itself is also changing. So this brings me to the last slide in this lecture. Why study the ISM? And I think it's a very appropriate question to ask at the beginning of the course, because I think you have to all understand why it's so important to study the ISM. The ISM is not a huge mass component, as you know, can see from the first uh, few slides that I showed. And only for the really low luminosity dark matter, ga dark matter dominated galaxy is the neutral hydrogen similar in mass to the stars. However, the medium, the ISM, is really the medium which, via which stars form. Star formation can only happen due to the collapse of cold molecular clouds. And these clouds, they have to be prevented from being dissociated by UV radiation. So they have to be surrounded by neutral hydrogen. On the other hand, molecular, molecules of hydrogen themselves cannot form without dust. So dust also is essential part of the interstellar medium. So, the, for star formation, the interstellar medium, the ISM is essential. But apart from that, there is still an importance of ISM for the kinematics of stars in a disk. And this was a very nice uh, study which was done by Lyman Spitzer in the 50s. And he showed that the stars, they will get gravitationally scattered by interacting with the dense molecular clouds. Because some molecular clouds can be very massive, a few hundred solar mass or even a few thousand solar mass. So when a star comes close to such a large mass, its orbit will be slightly deflected. So the scattering of disk stars by molecular clouds does affect the disk dynamics. 
And lastly, we should always remember that the ISM is one of the really the probes, the medium by which we can probe galaxies. Because in ISM, we have all the trace elements which get excited when there are energetic phenomena like star formation and supernova explosions happening. The spectral lines from star formation tell us a lot about star formation. The X-ray emission lines from the hot ionized medium around galaxies, especially elliptical galaxies, tell us about the X-ray, um, the equilibrium, the X-ray uh, gas equilibrium, and hence the mass of the galaxy, elliptical galaxy itself. So you see, the ISM components can help us trace both the mass of galaxies, the kinematics of their disks, the elemental abundances of galaxies, and they are also very important in the low luminosity galaxies as a mass component. So I will stop here and um, end this lecture. And in the next lecture, we will start looking at how we can use the spectral lines from the ISM to probe galaxies.